Again, I didn't assign your reviews. <laughs> I'll be the bad guy and <laughs> assign you a bunch. <laughs> Hopefully, these will be exciting papers. These are relatively old papers. Uh, Tuesday. Is there enough time? <laughs> well, we'll cover, we'll cover a multiscalar processor, so you'd better read that for Tuesday. Maybe let's do this. The first one is due Tuesday, the other two are due Thursday. Is that good? Okay. So you successfully negotiated <laughs> a better deadline. <laughs> Although we're going to cover Diva today mostly, so it'll be easy reading. October 11th is Thursday? I guess that's true. OK. OK. Yeah, multiscalar processors, uh, that was a seminal paper, uh, which never got implemented on any processor uh, to date. But it influenced a lot of uh, paper tigers, if you will. Uh, these are processors that uh, were imagined to be designed but never designed. But it did influence a lot of research in many areas. And some of the things uh, that it kind of led to may be in existing designs. So this is, a, this is an important paper. There are a lot of interesting concepts in that paper. Uh, I also assigned tr the transactional memory paper, uh, the original transactional memory paper, which is being implemented today in many different designs. And another paper that we will talk about today, the DIVA, the microarchitecture. Have you guys read any of these before? No? OK, good. Well, OK, last lectures, uh, Gena and Vivek covered caching, cache and memory compression, and efficient caching. So hopefully you know all of those by heart. But you read the papers, at least some of the papers they covered before. Today, we'll hopefully wrap up multi-threading and we'll smoothly transition into speculation, uh, which is one of the uses of multi-threading multi in existing parallel systems. Well, we'll mainly cover other uses of multi-threading. Remember, we covered, uh, we had two, two long lectures on multi-threading, so hopefully you'll know everything related to that now. So if I asked you, if I have a pop quiz right now, you would know every, every single answer about multi-threading. Who is so confident? <laughs> There's one person who's doing this. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> OK. Uh, other uses. I think we covered some of the slide. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about redundant execution. You read a paper related to this. Actually, you read the earlier paper. The later paper is the better paper. We'll talk about that a little bit. The earlier paper is a concept paper, and it didn't handle some of the implementation issues. The later paper, uh, the, uh, which was two years later in the same conference, ISCA, was a much more detailed study of the alternatives that actually talked about what are the implementation issues. And it actually found deadlocks that happened in the first paper. Uh, so I'd encourage you to read the second paper. Both are good papers. Uh, we will get to this later on. Uh, how to implicitly parallelize uh, single-threaded programs using thread-level speculation. If we, we, may, we may be able to get to it at the end of the lecture. And you already know helper threading, right? Uh, we briefly covered it in previous uh, courses. Uh, one thread helps the main program uh, to prefetch or subordinate micro-threading. We'll briefly cover that also. And we'll briefly cover the use of uh, multi-threading for exception handling. I didn't assign all these papers, of course, but hopefully this will give you a good idea. Let's take a look at uh, a different problem to solve with multiple threads. And the problem is fault tolerance. And specifically in terms of fault tolerance, uh, transient faults. I think I briefly described what transient faults are, right? These are faults that are not permanent in hardware, but they, that they persist for a short duration. These are also called inter intermittent faults or uh, soft errors, or soft faults. I guess, what is the uh, difference between a, a fault and an error? People use these things uh, interchangeably, but actually there is a difference in dependable computing terminology. 
No. So fault, for, for, uh, mm, let's say you have a, a wire uh, that uh, transi transiently goes to a one instead of being a zero. That's a fault, right? That shouldn't be a zero. But that fault may not affect the outcome that you're looking for, right? Which means that the fault may not manifest itself as an error in the end. So error is basically what happens to the outcome that you're looking for. Which means that error, the definition of the error is dependent on the outcome that you are looking for. Right? It could be uh, the outcome of uh, the state in the register file. Right? You may be uh, checking for whether the state actually matches an expected state, a golden state. If it doesn't match, then there's an error. You may get a transient fault that may manifest itself as an error, changes this ar uh, architectural state in the register file. Or that may not manifest, manifest itself as an error because that may not, uh, the fault may be masked, right? This is called fault masking. In the sense that that wire, whether it's a zero or one, may not matter in the end because you may take that wire and do a comparison and the result of the comparison may be the same, right? For, for that instruction, whether or not that wire is zero or one. Does that make sense? So fault is basically if, if the, whether or not the hardware is faulty, error is whether that fault manifests itself uh, at, at the outcome that you would expect. And the outcome you expect may not be just the register file, right? You may say, I only care about the final result of the program, right? In that case, that fault may, not have, may affect the architectural register file, but may not affect the final outcome of the program, which means that it's not an error from your point of view. Does that make sense? So that's the fundamental difference between fault, faults and errors. But people usually confuse these terms also. <laughs> so you may, you may see papers that write soft errors where what, where, when what they, mean, what they really mean is soft faults or transient faults. But because by, by that definition, you don't really need to detect every single fault that happens, right? If the fault is masked in hardware, it's, it's not going to change the outcome. You might as well not do anything about it. <laughs> the question is, do you know whether or not a fault is going to change the outcome? That's the difficult part. And that's a research question. And people have looked at answers to it. We're not going to cover uh, much of this. We can have a course on all of this, <laughs> all the, this, this topic, basically, fault tolerance. Uh, but I think we're going to have only one lecture, or maybe one and a half. OK. So soft. Uh, Soft faults or transient faults are, are a type of fault. They sh persist for a short duration, as opposed to hard faults. A hard fault persists, and it never goes away. Basically, a wire is always connected to the ground, for example, whereas it shouldn't be. <laughs> OK. Uh, transient faults are uh, caused by cosmic rays, uh, for example, a neutron particle hitting your computer. Uh, this may happen more often when you're up high flying uh, or under, under more adverse conditions, right? And these, well, I already talked about this, right? Leads to transient change in wires as well as state. So this could hit the register file and change the state of the flip-flop in your register file or DRAM memory or disk. Uh, so solution. I guess there is no practical absorbent for cosmic rays. We don't know how to handle it <laughs> uh, at, the, at the material level. And this is the estimated uh, fault rate. I don't know when this data is from, probably 1999 or so. Maybe it changes. So one fault per com 1,000 computers per year. And fault, fault rate is likely to increase in the future. Uh, that should be future, by the way. That's not feature. <laughs> mm. Why? Because we're making transistors smaller, and it, it becomes more likely that they will be affected by environmental disturbances. If your transistors are much larger, if they get hit by a particle, they can tolerate that. But when you're smaller, uh, you have a problem. Well, there are other issues. Reduced voltage, now your, your margins are, just, are smaller. When you're hit by a particle, your voltage level changes, and that may flip you to another state. Uh, 
there are higher tra transistor counts. We're putting more transistors, so that means that even if your fault rate stays the same, you'll get more faults on the same chip, right? And I guess reduced noise margins are similar to reduced voltage, but it's not the same thing. But you have, you're reduced more, once you reduce your voltage threshold, you need to reduce your noise margins too, likely. And you may not be able to tolerate the changes in your voltage as easily. OK, so we will need some sort of fault tolerance in the processors. And this already exists in uh, many processors. We'll get to that. Uh, but what, uh, the question is, what kind of fault tolerance do we need? Uh, some applications you may not care, right? In fact, probably this computer gets faults many of the time. And uh, there are so many software bugs that <laughs> maybe the, if you don't care about the hardware faults. That's not a good argument, though. That's not a good argument to design bad hardware. But uh, some app, at the application level, uh, you have different reliability requirements, right? Maybe in server apps, applications, uh, that deal with uh, your bank account, you care a lot more about faults. But you may not care as much when you're playing a game, right? If the bird goes the wrong way, flies the wrong way when you're playing Angry Birds, do you care? <laughs> is it because of a fault or is it because you didn't do it right? <laughs> Whereas with your bank account, you may care, <laughs> depending on where the fault happens, uh, in the sig which significant bit of your account. <laughs> It happens it. Uh, and users who do not require high reliability may not want to pay the overhead. And we'll see there are overheads associated with mm, fault tolerance. Right? Uh, you don't want to buy a cell phone that's extremely fault tolerant, but that costs you 2,000 bucks. Right? But you may want to buy a server that's extremely fault tolerant, and that costs you $5 million. Right? And actually, uh, you will hear about such a server uh, next Monday, uh, we'll have a guest lecture from one of the System Z architects, Brian Prasky. He'll talk about the System Z design, and hopefully he'll go into fault tolerance uh, features of System Z. And that's a machine that has a lot of fault tolerance features compared to many uh, processors that we have today. Why? Because it's designed for a particular application that really cares about, or particular customers that really care about fault tolerance. These are mainframes used in banking institutions, online transactions, where uh, tolerating faults is very important. So hopefully he'll talk about some of the fault tolerance features in the Z machine. Regardless, fault tolerance mechanisms with low hardware cost are attractive because uh, you can have a more general purpose design, right? One option is to have a design that's very fault tolerant, but that's very expensive. Now you're specializing your design to particular applications and customers, just like System Z does. Uh, but if you have very low hardware cost uh, mechanisms, then you can perhaps implement that in any computer. And now we have a general purpose processor. Right. OK. So I will not cover this in detail, but uh, you can divide the structures that you have on chip into two, right? Storage structures and logic structures. And fault tolerance mechanisms that you use for these structures are usually different. For, and there are usually two types of fault tolerance mechanisms. One is space redundancy or replication. In other words, you replicate the logic in some way or rep replicate the data uh, and detect the fault that way. And the other is time redundancy or redundant execution. You execute the program, replicate the program, and execute multiple copies of it and then compare results. These are two fundamental approaches. Uh, space redundancy goes nicely with storage structures, right? You can basically have error correcting codes that redundantly encode the data in some way. And uh, you check whether those codes have changed, right? And I don't know if you've taken a course on error correction. Probably not, right? Is there a dependable computing course at CMU? I think I asked this question before, and the answer was no. Maybe that's a good course to develop. That should be interesting. Who would be interested in taking such a course? None. No one. <laughs> Not if the reading list is that long. <laughs> well, that's a very humbling course to take. <laughs> because you 
uh, it's amazing what, uh, how, what goes into making processors or making platforms dependable, fault tolerant. And there are many techniques. OK, but basically, you can protect memories with error correcting codes. Redundantly store error correcting codes. And uh, uh, the key idea is basically, if, if the data changes, you can detect uh, that your data changed based on your code, that, uh, the, the code you stored. You could think of this, uh, uh, I guess, one error correcting code is actually replicating the entire data, right? You replicate the data. If one of them gets hit by a particle, you still have the other one. And you compare when you, you read both data. When you, read, uh, uh, when you do a read, you read both data and compare. And you can easily detect the error and where the error happens if you have that. But that's an expensive coding scheme. So there are more smarter coding schemes that encode the data. For example, parity is one way of encoding data, right? What is parity? You can XOR all the bits in the data. And that XOR uh, is your error correcting code, basically. And if one of the bits changes, now your XOR of the bits parity doesn't match the previous parity that you stored. So you can detect that that way. But parity is a very simple way. You can detect whether something has changed, but you cannot correct it because you do not know what, uh, what bit in your data has changed. Right? So there are more sophisticated mechanisms, which we will not go into. That's the subject of the dependable computing course that you guys don't want. <laughs> OK. Uh, so one downside of uh, something like this is, of course, you now we have over overhead, right? You have additional storage to store even the parity bits. Uh, and uh, these parity check operations can be uh, high latency, right? Because it's on your critical path. When you're reading the data, you should check. You could do it off the critical path. You could read the data, use it, and then if the error correcting code says you read the wrong data, then you can flush the pipeline. Right? Logic, uh, so storage structures are traditionally uh, studied uh, a lot more than logic structures. Logic structures are a little bit hard to uh, protect. Uh, in space runs, let's say you have an adder. How do you protect that adder? You could replicate the adder, right? This is, uh, if you replicate it, you can detect potentially uh, the error that happens. Let's say you have an adder, I guess. It's a better adder. You have two adders. You put the, give the same inputs to both adders, and then check if the results are equal. That's dual modular redundancy, or DMR. It's a space redundancy. Of course, now your overhead is more than 2x, right? And if you have triple modular redundancy, you can perhaps correct the error that happens. And the hope is that when a transient uh, fault, when a particle strikes, it won't affect multiple of these. Right? If it does, then you have another problem. Right? Then you need more redundancy. Okay, You can have triple modular redundancy and do a voting and take a majority vote of the adders and figure out, hopefully, if there's only one error, uh, if there's only one fault, you can figure out uh, what the uh, answer is. You can tolerate that. Of course, this is very expensive, right? An alternative is time redundancy. Basically, uh, instead of having these additional things, uh, you have the same adder. You execute the add instruction once, store the result somewhere, and then you execute it with the same inputs again and check if the second execution's result is the same as the first execution's result. And the hope is that, because there is enough time between these two executions, the hope is that you won't get the same transient fault. And you can detect the transient fault. And I guess if you really want to correct it, you can execute the add one more time, right? Three times and take the vote. There's still overhead in this, but it's not 2x, hopefully. There's storage overhead, buffering overhead. That's the idea of redundancy execution, time redundancy. Uh, 
There's also there's another overhead in time redundancy, right? Which is the latency overhead. With space redundancy, you can do the operations in parallel. Whereas with time redundancy, now you may want to do some other operation, but you cannot because you want, you're doing this redundant execution of the ad. So it's good to think about what are the downsides and upsides. But the area overhead of this is much lower. Okay. That's exactly what I said, right? Basically, space redundancy has high hardware overhead. Time redundancy has low hardware overhead, but high performance overhead. Because your adder is not available 50% of the time, if you think of it that way. Because 50% of the time, you're redundantly executing ads. I guess here's a question for you. What additional benefits uh, does space redundancy have that time redundancy doesn't have? If any. It gives you uh, additional resources. So if you're running a workload that doesn't necessarily need to be reliable, you've just doubled your mm -hmm. like available resources for, for computation. So like if you mm -hmm. could somehow additionally not only like if some mm -hmm. you could mark some workloads as reliable and those would go through like the two adders or whatever and mm -hmm. you could compare their outputs. But if you had a, a workload that didn't need to necessarily be reliable, it's mm -hmm. possible maybe you know, it's a lot of funny business going on, but it, you could sort of divide it into two pipelines. Sure, you could, you could use that additional resource for some other uh, computation. That's true, yes. That is a benefit, I guess, but I was more thinking, uh, thinking more of in terms of fault tolerance, what benefit you get. Yes? I was thinking if, um, if you just had time redundancy uh -huh. and the fault like somehow lasted in that, uh -huh. into both comparisons, you know, you wouldn't be able to detect it where it's less likely for it to affect two separate pieces of hardware. That's right. That's right. You were going to say the same thing? Or? Uh, no? no? Okay. You're, it must be right here. Okay. <laughs> you, you, you retract. That's right. That's, yeah. I think it can also become hard to have. Okay. Yes. So you, you took it to the next step, his answer to the next step, which is, Basically, with space redundancy, you can also correct hard errors, right? You could correct hard errors, or you could detect hard errors. Why? Because this may have a hard error or an error that lasts longer. Uh, with time redundancy, you may not be able to detect it. If it lasts long enough, you may not be able to detect that error. And hard error lasts forever, right? Which is long enough. <laughs> uh, whereas with space redundancy, as long as both of these components don't have the same error, then you can detect the errors. Right? And if you have more, you can correct the errors. Now, both, of, both components may have the same error, and this is called a common mode error. Sometimes space redundancy doesn't work because uh, you uh, fabricate two components, and they have the same problem. <laughs> and if you use them for... Uh, I guess, redundancy to detect faults, then you will not be able to because they have this common mode error. They will both have the same error at the same time. But that's not always the case. You could, you could design it slightly differently. Right? So that's the additional benefit of space redundancy. It can, it can not only tolerate transient faults, but also tolerate hard faults. Okay, keep that in mind. I guess we'll get back to it. Uh, well, you may want to think about how you can tolerate uh, trans, uh, hard errors with time redundancy also. Okay, so this is one technique that has been used for a long time uh, to tolerate errors, lockstepping. It's essentially this, except it's done at the processor level. If you want to protect an entire processor, what do you do? Well, you basically replicate the microprocessor and uh, each processor executes the same instruction. How do you ensure that uh, they execute the same instruction? Well, you replicate the inputs to the processor, both processors, such that they, you ensure that they receive the, both imp both, uh, the same inputs, same instructions with same data. This is called input replication. And uh, how do you, uh, well, the inputs are gotten from memory or disk, right? And the hope is that 
those parts are relatively easily uh, protected with error correcting codes. Like memory uh, is covered by error correcting codes and disks are covered by other codes. Well, same as error correcting codes. And hopefully the network is somehow covered by some other codes. And these two processors execute the same instruction and in the end when they finish the instruction, you have a logic that compares the outputs. And if the result is the same, then you declare victory. There is no error in, that ex in the execution of that instruction. So every instruction is executed this way. And this was implemented a long time ago. I think this was late 1970s. A uh, tandem computer uh, had, had systems where they had processors that were replicated. And when there was uh, an error detected, uh, they, basically they would, uh, they would have an LED that turned red. <laughs> and that was perhaps the most important part of the system. <laughs> Can you guys guess why? <laughs> so they had these data centers for the time, uh, which was big mainframes, and you have the server room. One big problem is figuring out which machine had an error. Right. How do you figure that out? Well, if you have a system like this, and when there is an error, some LED turns red, you can turn off the lights in the room and figure out which LEDs are red in the room. right? And then the operators can go and replace uh, those boxes or those, uh, those systems where the LEDs are red. So that actually saved uh, a lot of companies, a lot of costs, because otherwise it's very difficult to figure out <laughs> uh, what, mm, what systems had errors. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, and you can read tandem reports. I didn't reference them here. Maybe I should reference them in some other. Uh, maybe we'll put them on the website. On. And Compaq later bought tandem computers and uh, they designed systems like this. It was called Compaq Himalaya. Okay, so once you have this, of course this is very costly, right? Now you have two processors. You have space redundancy. Well, if you are multi-threading, the cost can be amortized a little bit. Because instead of having two processors, now you have two hardware thread contexts. And you can use one of those hardware thread contexts to redundantly execute the program. And this is the idea you read and reviewed. Uh, basically, you can replicate the thread, compare the outputs of redundant execution before committing an instruction. And it's essentially the same thing, except you don't replicate the microprocessor, and you but you have the hardware thread context. And you still need to do the same things. You need to replicate the inputs and compare the outputs. That's the idea of, uh, I guess, this paper. Uh, this is called redundant multi-threading. Multi uh, and these are two papers that introduced it. I think I have assigned you this first paper, but the second paper is a little bit earlier. It's a, within the same time frame. They're both good papers. Okay. I guess compared to lockstepping, what are the advantages of this? Well, obviously, you don't need to replicate the processor. Uh, you can use the idle cycles that happen within a thread to redundantly execute the other thread, right? If a functional unit, you have, if you have uh, multi simultaneous multi-threading, you have some functional units maybe idle at some point. That's what simultaneous multi-threading take, takes advantage of, right? Now you're taking advantage of those idle cycles to redundantly execute the program. So the performance overhead may not be very high. Right? Uh, compared to having fewer, uh, only one functional unit. The key is if you have multiple functional units and stall cycles you can redundantly execute without high overhead. And you can have lower hardware cost, better hardware utilization. You can use the other processor for something else. Of course, there are disadvantages too. I'll go over these. Uh, one is more contention between redundant threads. This is the same as uh, whenever you have multi-threading, you have more contention between threads, right? Which means that you'll have higher performance overhead compared to lockstepping. Because lockstepping, redundant threads, don't have any contention with each other, except for the shared memory or shared cache, wherever they share the memory hierarchy. 
And uh, this requires changes to the processor core now. You cannot just take the processor, uh, have another processor, and put some glue or comparison logic. Now you need to change the processor core uh, so that you do not, uh, you do the result comparison uh, within the processor core, right? And value communication within the processor core, as we'll see. And you should carefully fetch and schedule instruction from the instructions from the threads, right? Because now the threads are sharing resources in the SMT processor. And we've already seen fairness issues that are caused by resource sharing in, in SMT or multi-threading in general. Now this could lead to deadlock if you're waiting to commit an instruction from a thread because you're waiting for the corresponding redundant instruction to execute. If the redundant instruction is not even fetched, and if you do not have space in the machine to fetch that instruction, you may have a problem, right? So you need to carefully orchestrate these threads such that you never run into deadlock issues. Does that make sense to everyone? Right? Because you cannot commit an instruction from the thread until the <coughs> other thread executes the same instruction and you verify the, that the output is correct. If the other thread has not even fetched this instruction and if all of the machine resources are full, then you have a problem. Okay? There are solutions to it, but you need to uh, handle that. Yes? Wouldn't the, uh, the replicated one have higher uh, contention issues because there are two different pools that are operating on exactly the same data? Where, so both cache have to load or store to the same addresses and then I think more contention on the person the SMT, you will be fetching the things in the same cache and operating on the same data. With mm -hmm. So that's right. There, there are disadvantages to having multiple cores also because they don't share data. Right. But yeah. the contention will also increase because now they are operating on exactly the same data. Mm -hmm. So maybe one thing can pick out the cache and some other core. Where, where, where would the contention increase when you have SMT? No, in the two pool system. But they're, they're, they're operating on the same data, right? And they're, if they're not sharing resources, they would not be contending. They'll get it from memory. So the system is exactly the same, right? The contention happens. The question is whether this is the same core or different cores like this. If they are different cores, then they, have, they are sharing those things. Bus. That's right. But the, the bus is here, right? So that's the same, because you have memory supplying data to either one core or two cores. Okay. okay. And you cannot easily detect hard faults, right, with, uh, when, if you have uh, redundant threading or redundant multi-threading. Whereas if you have lock-stepping, two cores, you can detect the hard faults, unless you have a common mode error again. Well, I said easily, because there, there is a way you can detect the hard faults also, right? Especially if you have multiple functional units. You, what is the idea? I guess I've already given you a little bit of the idea, yes? That's right, exactly. You force the redundant thread to use, the different, use different execution units, basically, or different resources as much as possible. Okay, mm. so I guess I've implicitly uh, told you about this idea, but there's something called sphere of replication, which is the logical boundary of redundant execution within a system. And in this case, uh, basically, uh, here you have replicated execution within the sphere of replication, which means that input data that comes from the outside of the sphere of replication needs to be replicated and sent to redundant threads. That's what this shows. And anything that goes outside the sphere of replication should be checked, validated. Right? Because here you don't have replication. There's some other form of protection, but not replication, so you need to check. In, in a simultaneously redundant, I guess simultaneous redundant threading, 
or redundant multi-threading shortly. This is what the sphere of replication looks like. Because we're doing this within a, within a core, you can actually fetch the same instruction and distribute it to multiple threads, right? That's where you replicate the input. Uh, register file does not, uh, may not need to be replicated also, right? If you actually fetch the data from the register file and distribute it to different threads. But you may not want to do that for performance reasons. So they, and it's not done here, but data cache is not uh, replicated, which means that a value that comes from the data cache uh, gets replicated and sent to different threads. Does that make sense? Basically, data cache and instruction cache are outside the sphere of replication. Yes? How do, you, how do you tell a thread to use? You can change the scheduler, right? You can change the scheduling logic such that whenever you execute an add from thread 0, send it to functional units 0, three, zero to 4. Whenever you execute uh, an add from thread 1, send it to execution units 1, 3, 5. That's one way. Now, that's, there's a downside to that, right? If you do it this way, now you're, a thread can utilize only half of your execution units. There may be smarter ways, but that adds more complexity. Uh, ideally, what you would like to do is you would like to know which functional unit uh, the, the leading instruction, the same instruction, went to. And you would like to send the replica to a different functional unit. But that kind of information, fine-grained information tracking, may have more overhead, right? Now you need to know where you have executed the previous uh, one instance of the instruction such that you send the other instance to another functional unit. So there could be a simpler way of doing that. And people have employed uh, shifting uh, of functional unit assignments. So you could shift the functional unit assignments when you, uh, based on your thread ID. And that would hopefully achieve the same effect without significantly destroying your utilization. OK. Does that make sense? Yes. About the other the previous logic about with the two cores, how do you maintain the lock stepping? You have to do something in hardware. Yeah, you need, you need additional logic that maintains that lock stepping. Yeah, th that's actually an issue. But we will not get into that. You can read the papers related to that. It's, it's not as easy. <laughs> you, need, you need to make sure that uh, state doesn't get updated. Right. OK. OK, that's the sphere of replication. Uh, in, yeah. in this particular case, if you are doing like, uh, time slicing between the threads, you don't really need to replicate the data. It will automatically be fetching the instruction of this data. Well, let's take a look. Let's, uh, basically, one, one question is instructions, uh, you can basically use a program counter, right, and fetch the instructions. And hopefully, if the instruction cache is protected, you'll get the instruction replication for free. But what about data? Uh, when you do a load in one thread, how do you, get the, how do you ensure that uh, you're checking the correct thing? So if you do the same load, Let's say you have load into register 1 with some base register. You do this load, go to data cache, and get the data value and store it somewhere. Let's call it value 1. And then the redundant thread needs to do the same load. The question is, when does it do this load and how does it do this load? One option is, uh, to wait for both loads to happen at the same time, right? What you can do is you can, when you get this load, you wait for the pairing load and check if the address is the same. Assuming the address is the same, you just load, do the load once and get the same value, right? This is the first thing here. Access to cache when both loads are ready to execute. Now, this may not be a good idea because now you're 
waiting, right? Whereas these threads are really independent except for the checking part. <laughs> so you, you're really causing additional weights uh, because of input replication. You want to get the same input. Another option is you get value one, and when you actually uh, execute this load, you access the data cache again and get a value two. And compare value one and value two at the end. Now this sounds perfectly fine, right? Well, it's not because uh, value one and value two may be different, not because of a fault. Right? Some other processor may have modified that data because it may be shared data. Right? Or some I.O. device may have modified that data because you may be accessing some uh, memory mapped I.O. Right? So you cannot just say these two loads are going to access the data cache independently. So the solution uh, in this paper is basically do the load once, first load loads the data, and uh, this is the load that probes the cache, buffers the data value in this load value queue, and the trailing load, if you will, basically gets the data from the load value queue instead of probing the cache again. That's the idea. Now to be able to do this, you designate the leading and trailing th threads. You, you will really need to do that anyway. So you have a leading thread and a trailing thread. Leading thread populates this load value queue and trailing thread reads out of that load value queue. Make sense? Simple. Uh, how do you do the output compare? This way, this way, basically, you don't have that much performance impact, right? Because you don't need to synchronize the loads. Well, both loads can go independently. And you don't have this coherence problem. Uh, so how do you do the output comparison? Uh, basically, uh, you need to compare and validate at commit time, right? Uh, you have the address and data for stores from redundant threads, and this is one example. You can have stores. Uh, and before you write the store to the data cache, you need to validate that the trailing thread has uh, generated the same value and the same address for the store as the leading thread did. And you can only do this at commit time. Uh, and after that, you write to the data cache. Well, I guess there are some issues. How do you handle cached versus uncacheable loads? Uh, I'll let you think about that. That's relatively easy. But stores now lead to st stay longer, right? It's a little longer here, but stay longer. Because uh, again, the leading thread may, may have a store, and the trailing thread may be trailing by, I don't know, 100 cycles or so later, the store cannot be committed because the trailing thread needs to execute the same store before you can commit it. Now this is less of a problem than loads because stores can be off the critical path, right? You can have a store buffer and leading thread can hopefully continue and stores can be in the store buffer. Now again, that's that's not perfectly fine because as you increase the size of the store buffer, you're increasing the size of a structure that loads need to check right, to forward data. So it's not that scalable. So it's not a performance impact. And you need to ensure that matching trailing store can commit. This is actually the problem that I was describing before. Let's say this is the size of your store queue and you don't, uh, your store queue is full and you have a store here that's waiting for the matching trailing store, but you cannot fetch the trailing store because there is not enough space here. And you cannot retire any instruction because you retire in order. Right? So you need to ensure that that deadlock doesn't happen. And the second paper describes those issues very clearly, which is this paper, Detailed Desi Design and Evaluation of Redundant Multithreading Alternatives. OK, so these are all, hopefully all simple concepts, right? But, uh, if you read this paper, it's uh, interestingly hard to put into a real design. <laughs> because real designs are very complicated and you need to ensure all of these cases 
uh, deadlock cases don't happen. And uh, there are other issues. Uh, this comes at a performance impact, as you read in the paper. Uh, but you can take advantage of the fact that you have two thread contexts on the same processor to improve performance. What you can do is you can supply the results from the leading thread to the trailing thread, such that the trailing thread actually runs faster. Right? Uh, of course, speculatively, right? Because trailing thread's purpose is really to check the results. If you supply the results, you cannot check the results you've supplied, right? <laughs> it makes no sense. Then you're not checking the results. So the purpose of supplying the results is to speed up the trailing thread, but trailing thread still needs to check and verify the results. Mm. So branch outcomes, for example, but that branch outcome is a prediction anyway, which needs to be verified with execution. So you can supply that, that from the leading thread to the trailing thread. Assuming leading thread executed the branch instruction correctly, now the trailing thread has sped up. Right? <coughs> and leading thread might have mispredicted that branch. But because it executed that branch instruction early, it determined uh, the outcome correctly, assuming there's no fault. And it can supply that outcome to the trailing thread, now trailing thread doesn't need to incur that branch misprediction. Make sense? Okay. So this paper describes several different, uh, I guess two different types of simultaneous redundant or redundant multi-threading. One is simultaneously and redundantly threaded processor and we'll take a look at that later on. So I would encourage you to read this paper. I didn't uh, require this reading. You read the first paper and you've seen that's the idea paper. This is the second paper versus the real implementation paper, basically. How do you make this idea work in real life? And if you read this here, uh, using a detailed commercial grade SMT processor design, we uncover, uncover subtle RMT implementation complexities and find that RMT, redundant multi-threading, can be a more significant burden for single processor devices than prior studies indicate prior study you read already. Uh, and you can read the rest. Yes? But if there is a branch divergence between the reading and the trading threads, then the store buffer will become true without a matching store uh, What do you mean branch divergence? Means the first, uh, first thread executed branch is correctly, let's say, and the uh -huh. reading thread executed correctly, then they are on different paths, so we wouldn't find the matching stores. Well, that's why you check at retirement time, right? Every instruction. Every instruction needs to be checked at retirement time. Okay. If you do that at retirement time, then you'll detect when that divergence happens. Okay, so this is a branch outcome queue that I uh, described to you briefly. Basically, the trailing thread can uh, put the results of its branches into this branch outcome queue, and the leading thread, when it fetches that branch, gets the prediction from that outcome queue. You need to synchronize that well, of course. And you can read the paper. This paper describes uh, that optimization. And you can also have line prediction queue. This is, we did not, maybe we briefly covered it in 740. But um, a lot of alpha processors uh, fetch instructions using line predictions. Uh, what is the problem? The problem is when you do a fetch, uh, you don't even know whether you fetched a branch, right? In the next cycle, you want to figure out which instruction cache line you need to fetch from. How do you do that? Well, the idea is line prediction. Predict the next instruction uh, cache line or cache block that is going to come after this cache block. It's basically a branch predictor, except it operates at the cache line level. Right. Uh, basically, you, you fetch contiguous block of eight instructions. It's the same thing as branch outcome queue at the line level. Okay, you can read about this. Uh, I think I already recommended you that paper, right? Uh, it's from Kessler. It's a very good paper to read. Uh, I guess the Alpha twenty one two sixty four microprocessor. Those of you who've taken 740 should have read it, even if you don't remember. 
IEEE Micro, 1999. This describes the design of the Alpha 21264. And this is uh, based on 21464, which is uh, sim simultaneously multi-threaded. And this was the fastest processor of its time. This actually did exist, and this uh, never came to life because uh, Compaq uh, died or got bought uh, before uh, this was produced. Okay. I think we already discussed this, but you can actually handle permanent faults with simultaneous redundant threading or redundant multi-threading. Uh, we've already answered this questions. Can you incorporate explicit space redundancy into redundant multi-threading? And the answer is yes. Execute the same instruction on different resources. And we've already covered how you can do that. Okay, a little bit about the evaluation. This should have performance overhead, of course. Uh, and this paper has good evaluation also. Uh, this is what they did, basically. Uh, they had spec CPU 95 applications at the time. And they executed 15 million instructions per thread. It was a slow simulator because it was very detailed. Uh, and this was their design, basically. This is uh, similar to Alpha 21 to 64. Uh, 464. You can read the rest from the paper. But uh, overhead, according to their simulator, uh, was a 30% performance degradation because of redundant multi-threading. So you get redundancy, but the performance degradation is 30%. Mm. And of course, you have an unav unavailable thread context also, right? Because you use it for the redundant thread. And they also have some optimizations. This shows per thread store queue, which improves performance by 4%. The question is, are you willing to pay that 30% performance overhead to get that redundancy benefit? What would your answer be? <laughs> I guess it depends, right? It depends on what kind of workload you're running on this. Probably not with Angry Birds, <laughs> unless you're very, <laughs> or probably not with your very high performance game, right? Because you can make the calculation. What fraction of the time does this error happen? I guess when the error happens, it could be really bad. <laughs> Your quality of service can go down significantly. But are you willing to tolerate that performance overhead? And it turns out for general purpose computing, uh, most people's answer to this 30% is no. We're not going to tolerate that performance overhead. I'd rather have a processor that is not tolerant to transient faults. then have this overhead. So uh, there's been a lot of research that tried to reduce this overhead to 5%, 10%. Even 5% and 10% is relatively high for many general purpose computing systems. So if you can reduce it to 2%, 3%, then you can have a big research contribution, perhaps. These were some of the earlier papers. There has been a lot of research in the last 10 years on this topic. And if you're interested, you can either talk with me or read the papers on your own. You can find them. OK, well, this paper actually proposed something else also, uh, which is, uh, I guess, uh, which could lead to good exam questions, <laughs> because uh, it's an interesting uh, design. Basically, uh, what if you already have two cores? With, with simultaneous redundant threading, you're splitting one processor into two half-size cores, conceptually. Right? Uh, well, you, you're, you're really not splitting the cores, but you're using the same core and more efficiently instead of having two cores. Right? But what if you already have two cores? And if you have uh, these two cores, and if you are multi-threading in these two cores, what you can do is uh, you can have the leading thread on one core and the trailing thread on the other core. And leading thread of another thread, separate thread, in this core, and the trailing thread in this core. And you add these queues that are needed, load value queue, line prediction queue, and store queue. Right. Now you still have the benefit of multi-threading, but now your leading and trailing threads are running on separate cores. So you get physical redundancy, uh, or space redundancy, 
as well as time redundancy. Make sense? So what is the downside of this though? <laughs> is, if any, yes. You lose the performance benefit of running the same thing on the same chip because of the shared cache. And since, mm -hmm. since if a reading and trading run on the same chip, then they will share the same cache. Mm -hmm. So they won't but, but you're not getting the, well yeah, instruction cache, that's true. Instruction cache. Uh, benefit is not there. But the data cache benefit, there's one leading thread and this thread is not accessing the data cache anyway, right? Because it's getting the load values from this load value queue. But instruction cache, you're right. Instruction cache, they won't be sharing the instructions. The hope is that they're uh, protected by ECC. So that's the idea here. Uh, the cost is, uh, well, uh, there are two costs, two downsides. Mm. Well, I guess uh, let's take a look here. Uh, the, the downside of this is these queues are now outside the cores, right? And they have to be incorporated somehow into the cores as additional inputs. Whereas if you had leading and trailing thread, threads for the same thread, you can more easily incorporate these queues into the design. And the other downside is, as you said, instructions. Now you're not sharing the instructions. And you can think of potentially other downsides. OK, any questions? Yes? What if there's a fault with your trading thread hardware? What if there is a? There's a like, you could, well, if you. I mean, then, then your leading thread might be correct, but you just keep on getting. But you will detect that, right? Because you're always comparing leading threads result to trailing threads result before commit. But, but you don't know if your leading thread hardware is wrong or if your trailing thread hardware is wrong, since they are two different. But it doesn't matter, right? So it's the same thing as the other way around. <laughs> this is just for detection, right? You don't know which, uh, which one is faulty. <laughs> you need something else to figure out which one is actually faulty. <laughs> Maybe you need to run some test programs afterwards to once you figure out. But if this is just for, if this is just for tr transient faults, then that's not a problem, right? OK. So I'll talk about two other uh, approaches to transient fault tolerance. People have looked at many, many approaches. Uh, I guess the first one is more common than transient faults itself. But I like the idea. That's why I assigned you the paper. Uh, it's called DIVA. The idea is to. Uh, have two cores. The first core executes the, th uh, the application or the program, and it can have faults. In fact, it may be designed to have faults sometimes, such that it's fast. Right? You may actually design this core to be extremely fast, and maybe sometimes you uh, get wrong results. But you design another core at the end that's called a functional checker that just checks the correctness of the execution. Uh, that just checks the correctness of the computation done in the main processor. Basically, it receives instructions and data values from the main processor and their results. And it basically checks if that was correct. That's the idea. Does it make sense? Well, the key question is, uh, well, the benefit is main processor can be prone to faults or sometimes incorrect yet very fast. You can, for example, reduce the critical path such that you get errors sometimes. Because not all, critical, not all inputs exercise a critical logic path that you have. You may decide to get errors sometimes because it may be that those inputs that exercise your critical paths are very uncommon. Right? And in that case, your checker may detect that you've done the wrong thing and correct it or take actions to correct it. So there's a benefit to this. And certainly, if you have transient faults, your checker will hopefully detect that because you're doing redundant execution. And you can design the checker to be more reliable. Right? You can have bigger transistors in this check checker. But of course, the key question is, how can the checker keep up with the main processor? Right? Main processor is designed to be fast and faulty. It's generating all these instructions. How do you design this checker? to check very quickly, such that it doesn't, it's not the bottleneck. 
Because if the checker is slower than the processor, then that's terrible, right? This is useless. <laughs> well, I guess I, I, <laughs> I've shown it to you, but maybe you re read it. <laughs> Any ideas? Yes? One way, I don't need if it applies here, but uh, you can check out more, gra more granularities. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, just to draw an analogy, if you have a C model and an RPL design, mm -hmm. you can be sure that C has less level of abstraction, but it will be correct. Mm -hmm. And RPL will, may have faults, so you can compare the <coughs> C model and RPL. So, something similar. Like so, basically, you can, you're, you're saying the checker may operate at a coarser granularity. And it doesn't check every instruction, yeah. but it checks. But somehow <coughs> you need to know. That's right. Yeah. To that's right. Yeah. So that's yeah. If you modify the program and have some something like markers that you and you know some invariants, perhaps people have proposed approaches like that, uh, and that could be doable potentially. But I'm uh, let's let's ignore that solution now because that's a complicated solution too. Yes. Okay, that's a good start. Big Core has already done a lot of work. Right. The idea is to take advantage of that. Basically, you don't need to do everything that the Big Core does. You just need to verify whether this main core was correct, right? That's the idea, basically. Basically, you strip down everything else from the core uh, other than only those things that you need to verify. And we'll see an example of it. What do you need to verify an instruction? Well, you need the instruction, which is hopefully uh, uh, correct. You need the sources, which are hopefully correct, and you just need to execute them. Right? That's it, right? You don't need to do scheduling, for example, in the, the small core. And the other realization is that this verification of different instructions can be performed in parallel. Right? You don't need to, uh, this checker core doesn't need to be a real core. It's really a functional checker. It's checking whether the instruction was correct. It's not. The goal is not to re-execute the program in this case. The goal is to check whether the main core was correct. So if the main core was incorrect in one of the instructions, the remaining instructions will be flushed anyway. So you independently verify all instructions in parallel in the checker. And if one instruction is incorrect, you flush all of the younger instructions anyway. Make sense? Because your verifications may be incorrect for the younger instructions, but you don't care because they're incorrect anyway. That's the idea. Yes? If you remove a certain critical part, then you have kind of hard error which cannot be fixed because the hardware is not supported to handle that particular case. And if, even if you re execute it, it won't well, 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 we'll get to that. That's a good point. Yes, if, if this, is, this is for the use case where I said uh, mm, you basically increase your frequency by ignoring some critical paths, right? But well, maybe there is a way. To, maybe there is a way to solve that problem. Okay. So that's here's the idea. Basically, this is a traditional out of order core. Where in Diva cores, you have this core instructions, and their inputs and outputs are supplied to this checker, and the checker has a very short pipeline. It's in order. Its purpose is just to verify and commit. And what does a checker look like? Well, it could be relatively simple. This is an oversimplified version, perhaps, but it's really not more uh, than this. Basically, you have the speculative result and the instruction. And you have the instruction uh, source 1 and source 2 uh, that go into this execution pipeline. And you check whether the result of this execution is the same as the speculative result that you get from the core. And you need to do something else for. Uh, loads. And this, the paper that you're going to read specifies that exactly, what you do need, need to do for loads, basically. Does that make sense? That's the idea. 
and it's called DIVO, Dynamic Implementation Verification Architecture. Let's see, do I want to talk about anything else? Since you're going to read the paper, I'm not going to cover this in detail, as long as you get the basic idea, uh, that's important. But now, if you have something like this, uh, you can do other things, right? You can have a self-tuned system. What is that? Uh, you can have something like this. You can have the core. You can have, uh, this is basically a dynamic voltage and frequency scaling engine. And maybe you have the core temperature. You basically increase your voltage and frequency. And this checker monitors the error rate you get at a given voltage and frequency. And if your error rate is higher, higher than tolerable, you start decreasing your voltage and frequency. Does that make sense? This way you can actually handle that case where your critical path, where you ignore some critical paths, and you, you start getting errors, and you will hopefully correct them at some point. And you will read this in the paper, basically. So you can think of other ways of designing the system also. Basically, you can, uh, well, I guess omitting logic is difficult, but you can turn off some logic uh, in the Diva core. And if you get wrong answers, uh, then uh, you will start turning on, potentially, right? You can imagine different things that are happening uh, to improve system performance and efficiency if you have this checker in the system. Okay? I guess you'll need to do this anyway for your review, so maybe it's, it's better not to do this here. I was going to tell, uh, well, I guess we can cover briefly. What, are, what is the upside of this? I guess I've given you the upside. You can, you can design a much more self-tuning or self-adapting system if you have this checker. You can tolerate transient faults. Uh, you can potentially tolerate other faults as well. What are the downsides? Why doesn't everyone do this today? I guess I didn't tell you people don't do it today, but it's implicit now. <laughs> it's not done today. And it sounds like a great idea, right? <laughs> no? Maybe that's what you will think about when you, re when you do the reviews. Then for transient error detection or the other purposes? For other purposes, because it could be a good substrate for many things, right? Yes? It's going to be a waste of a lot of power, even with the tuning part, if you're always like, running things fast, and then you're like, well, I'm going to do Power and efficient because you have this checker, additional checker, checker right? Even if you don't do that. <coughs> uh, to, that's, yeah, that's, that is one of the reasons, actually. There, there is a power overhead. And there is actually a performance overhead also, and that performance overhead is not low. And you, can, you can think about that performance overhead because you're going to read the paper. We're going back to that 10% again, right? 10%, how much overhead can you tolerate in a general purpose system? And that overhead is not low in this case because you're lengthening the pipeline. Although that's not as important. Um, but you need to get the uh, data values from somewhere, right? The question is, how do you get those data values? If you look at this checker, this checker, when it gets a load, uh, it needs to somehow read uh, memory. Now, how do you read memory? You need to get access to the cache. How do you access the cache? Well, the cache is being accessed by the main processor. You either add another port to the cache, which is costly, or you arbitrate between the main processor and the checker. Once you arbitrate, you lose performance, right? Because the main processor cannot make as, as fast progress. <coughs> 
Now you could perhaps think about improving this by supplying the values also. Mm. But then that, that complicates the design now. But think about it once you read the paper. So hopefully you'll find downsides, more downsides. OK. I guess let's take a look at another example. Uh, should we take a break before we take a look at another example? Yes? No? Or do you want to keep going and finish early? I have 30 more slides, so. <laughs> Let's take a break for five minutes. <laughs> and then we'll be back at 5.50. Uh, and I didn't assign this paper. I assigned uh, Todd Austin's DIVA paper. Because hopefully you'll develop some, ide some new ideas based on this. So there's another way of actually looking at this paper, which the paper motivates, uh, not from the transient fault tolerance perspective. The perspe I've given you that perspective a little bit. Today, we design processors in a worst case way. Right? You design the critical path and set the frequency based on that worst case. Uh, and you actually have even more margins to ensure that that worst case doesn't happen in real life. So there's. You could actually run the pr processor at a much higher frequency, but then you can get errors. Right. Uh, you may not get transient errors. Transient errors may not be a problem, but if you start running your processor at a much higher frequency, you'll get errors. That's why we have these guard bands in designing the critical path. If you have this kind of checker, you can now stretch your frequency, make it much faster, and you can detect the errors, and you can Hopefully, though, if, if you do not, if your worst case doesn't happen in real life, then you'll be running at much faster, at a much faster uh, rate or much faster execution time than you could otherwise run, right? That's another way of looking at the problem. You design uh, the system or the processor and the checker, not for the worst case, but for the common case. And if the worst case somehow happens, you correct it. In fact, overclockers take advantage of this, right? They, they overclock their machines because machines have these guard, band, guard bands uh, to protect for the worst case. And they don't get errors. I guess they could tolerate the errors in their games. That's, a, that's an example of application. Overclockers uh, usually tend to be gamers. <laughs> they, they want the fastest frequency from their machine. And that's one example application where you can tolerate a lot of the errors. OK, uh, whereas the second mechanism that I'll describe is specifically uh, designed for error tolerance. Basically, the idea is simple. The idea is to use cache miss stall cycles to redundantly execute instructions. If your program is spending a lot of its time on cache misses, why not use these cycles to redundantly execute? In this case, you may not even need a new thread context. Uh, the benefit is redundant execution does not have high performance overhead in that case because you're using stall cycles. The downside is what if there are no or few stall cycles? Now you have a problem, right? <laughs> so you can think of humans operating this way. I don't know if you guys operate this way, but I'm sure there are people that operate this way. <laughs> you perform actions. You have two states. You perform actions. And when you're idle or forced, either internally or externally, you go into a state of introspection which you introspect about your actions, you check them somehow. And when you're done checking, and, or when you need to be busy, you don't have time to introspect, you go back to perform. But there is also a step where you keep record of your actions, right? This, this requires you remembering your actions. You can think of these as instructions that are executed. So if you apply this to microarchitecture, you perform some instructions, execute instructions, record them into this buffer. And when you get an L2 cache miss, or when the buffer is full, you start verifying the results, introspecting. And how do you verify the results? You re-execute them in this case. That's, all bit, that's where the analogy breaks, I guess. You don't re-execute when you introspect. You could, perhaps, as a humans. And when the miss is serviced, 
or when the buffer becomes empty, you go back to normal execution. Basically, redundant execution happens when you get a long latency cache miss, or when you're forced to do, do it, when your buffer is full. The hope is that you will not be forced to do it because you have enough cache misses, at least in programs that you care about. Of course, that's the Achilles heel of this idea also, which is you really would like to eliminate those stall cycles, right? If you cannot eliminate them, this is one way of taking advantage of them. And how do you do this? Uh, you can take a look at the paper. So this doesn't require uh, significant hardware changes. Uh, but you do need this backlog buffer, this, uh, the leading thread, if you will, uh, executes instructions and put the, puts the instructions on the backlog buffer. And the trailing thread starts executing when you get a cache miss. And it has its own register file and compares its results to the backlog buffer. And similarly to uh, redundant multi-threading, the trailing thread doesn't access the data cache. When you're in this introspection mode, you get the data values from the backlog buffer. And the assumption is that backlog buffer is uh, an SRAM structure that's already uh, protected by error correcting codes. So you won't have, uh, basically, this is outside the sphere of replication right? because you get your data values from there. So this is relatively simple. It doesn't have many modifications to the processor pipeline, right? You can have a single threaded processor. Yes? But what if you made a mistake in address calculation in the leading thread? Mm -hmm. Again, you will, you will catch that, right? Yeah. yeah. You're checking every single instruction. <coughs> OK, what is the performance impact of this? All of these have performance impact. But in this case, the performance impact is high if you have uh, workloads that are not memory intensive, and these are the workloads that are not memory intensive, so it could go up to 50%. Whereas workloads that are very memory intensive, the performance impact is very low. Okay? I guess some food for thought for you. This would be normally where I leave you with, but I'll continue. <laughs> uh, do you need to check that the result of every instruction is correct? All of these mechanisms that I described check every single instruction, right? <coughs> but you mentioned you could do that coarse grain, right? That's actually an interesting direction some others have explored. Like if you can do this checking at the coarse grain, at the block granularity, for example, or if you can have invariance in your code, uh, maybe the programmer inserts something into the code uh, that doesn't vary. Like that, that holds true. Assert statements, for example. Right? You, if, you, if you code based on assert statements, you may just check those asserts, whether those asserts are correctly executed. Right? If they're not correctly executed, you go back somewhere else some, to the, some checkpoint in the program and re-execute. That's the idea. Maybe you don't need to check every instruction is correct. How do you do it? Well, you can read some papers. Do you need to check that the result of any instruction is correct? <laughs> it's a different question, right? <laughs> Maybe you don't care, right? If the outcome is good enough, maybe you don't need to do this checking. And there are some applications where the outcome could be good enough, right? Maybe, uh, let's say, your program is displaying some image on the screen, and your image still looks OK, even, the, even if there are errors. If you know that, then you can tolerate all of those errors, right? If you know that your application is tolerant to errors. But then this requires knowledge of the application now and how much you can tolerate. And that's an open research question also. Can your hardware be wrong and still be OK? I guess this is another question. What do you really need to check to ensure correct operation? This, also, this depends on the mm, definition of correct operation. One, one very strict definition is every instruction should be correct. But that's not what the user cares about in the end, probably, right? The user cares about what they see. So this is probably too strict definition of a correct operation. And you can think about the rest. OK, let's cover a, a couple of other uses of multi-threading. Uh, 
One is uh, the use of multi-threading for exception handling. We briefly alluded to uh, this before. And it's a simple idea. Uh, well, the problem is exceptions cause overhead. And some exceptions are handled in software. For example, some, there are some machines that handle TLB misses in software. Right. Mm. Spark is one example of that. Right? X86 is not one example of that. X86 handles lots of things in hardware. Mm. If, if they're handled in software, what happens is uh, when you detect an exception, let's, let's talk about a TLB miss to begin with, because a TLB miss is an exception that really doesn't halt the program, right? You can recover from that exception. In fact, you should recover from that exception, otherwise you, you can never execute any program. Mm, and you can, uh, when you detect the exception, uh, this, 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 these are slides from the paper that I will reference next, but you're executing the application. It gets to an exception, TLB miss. What needs to happen is you flush the pipeline, fetch and execute the exception handler, and after the exception handler is executed, I guess flush the pipeline again, and refetch the application code. So it causes some disturbance in the pipeline. Right? You need to fetch and execute this exception handler and flush the applications, even though the instructions that you're going to execute in the application are going to be the same. Right? The only difference is now you have a TLB entry uh, put into your TLB a correct mapping cached in your TLB. So some instructions will be able to execute because they were dependent on the TLB miss, but other instructions are unchanged. So wouldn't it be nice if these, up, these instructions actually stayed in the pipeline while this exception was being handled? Well, if you have another thread context on the same core, that's exactly what you can do. Well, I guess I'll, I'll not skip this, but the gist of this is if you have, if you're, uh, this, is, this is the number of stages in your processor pipeline. As you increase the number of stages in your processor pipeline, the penalty cycles you spend for TLB miss increases because you're flushing a, big, a longer pipeline right? and you need to refill that pipeline. Whereas if you had a multi-threaded processor, you can execute the application handler, uh, exception handler on the separate uh, thread, thread context. Why? Because the same application instructions are executed. And these are uh, in the order, uh, in the same order, independent of the exception handler execution. Right? So whether or not you had an exception here didn't matter. You're executing in the same order. And the data dependencies between the thread and the exception handler are minimal, as I said. You get one TLB entry. So the idea is to have uh, the exception handler in a separate thread context and ensure the appearance of sequential execution. Basically, the thread, when, he, when it gets to an exception, it launches the exception handler in the separate thread context. And there is some dependency that needs to happen between these two threads now. That's the additional cost over simultaneous multi-threading or multi-threading in general. Because this thread shouldn't be able to retire instructions until this exception handler executes, right? And you could do it in different ways. You could read the paper to figure out how you do it. But you could have a dependency uh, between the TLB, the instruction that had the TLB miss here, and the instructions from the exception handler. Right. And if you do this, now you can reduce the cost of uh, uh, software exception handling for TLB misses. This was the cost. It's about uh, penalty cycles were about 20 two cycles with the traditional software-based handling. And if you use multi-threading with two different designs here, you can reduce it to about 11 cycles according to this performance results. If you had actually handled the exception purely in hardware, that's, the cost would be much lower. And the paper has good analysis, so I'd encourage you to take a look at this paper. paper. It's a small idea, but this is one other benefit of uh, multi-threading. Use it for these auxiliary tasks that you need, that you really need for execution. And we've already discussed you could use multi-threading for interrupts, right? Interrupt handling. And you guys remember from 
both 740 and 447, what's the difference between exceptions and interrupts? That could be the pop quiz. <laughs> what is the fundamental difference? That's right, the cause, right? That's really the fundamental difference. Exception is internal to the running process or running thread, which determines uh, its context of handling. It needs to be handled within the context of that running thread, which also usually determines its priority. Its priority is the same as the running thread because it's caused by the running thread. Whereas interrupts are external to the running thread. And they could be completely independent, right? For example, even though some machines call uh, machine check uh, interrupt, some, you'll, you'll see that it's called exception. This is another place where terminology is very confused. Uh, many people are confused in terminology, but there's a clear distinction. Mm. So interrupts are external, which means that uh, they don't need to be handled right away. Whereas exceptions are internal. You, if you get a TLB miss, you cannot continue this running process. Right? You need to handle it right away. That cause determines when you handle it. Except you would also remember from 447 and 740, there are some interrupts that you need to handle right away. Right? What were those? I already given you machine check, for example. That's one of them. Power loss is another one, right? <laughs> You'd better handle power loss regardless of <laughs> whether or not, it's, a, it's not internal to the running process, but you better do something about re, uh, not losing data if you have that interrupt in the system. So interrupts can be handled more easily because they're really separate from the running thread. Exceptions cause a little bit more problem because you need to handle this dependency uh, between the running thread uh, and this internal exception. Okay, so I think we've covered a lot of uses but why do we have these uses? I think we've already covered that. Uh, because this multi-threading hardware, having multiple hardware contexts on the same chip, enables uh, the ability to communicate and synchronize between multiple threads at very low latency. And high bandwidth, too. I guess high bandwidth matters, for example, in Diva, right? Uh, it's enabled by the proximity of threads in hardware. Uh, so if you did not have this multi-threading context, you could, you could use all of these ideas on separate cores, right? These ideas are not really specific uh, to multi-threaded hardware. The problem is multi-core has higher latency to achieve any of this. So for example, you could handle, you could execute the exception handler on a separate core. But now your latency between the cores is higher. Whereas if you had multiple threads on the same core, your latency is much lower. One other example is helper threading. This will be a review for many of you. The basic idea here was, and you read a paper, uh, su simultaneous subordinate mi uh, micro-threading, which is essentially helper threading. The idea is basically to pre-execute a piece of the program or some helper program uh, solely, uh, well, in, ca in case of prefetching, solely for prefetching data. You guys all remember this? We don't need to go over this in detail. Basically, uh, there are some pieces of code that leads to cache misses. And if you can figure this out somehow, no, this doesn't go down. Let's say this is your program. You have a load instruction here. You figure out that this caused a lot of cache misses. And there's a slice of the program that leads to this load. And using the compiler or the hardware, you can figure out all of the instructions that lead to this load and take it out as a separate thread, package it, and you can now execute these instructions separately from the main program. And when the main program inserts an instruction into the main program saying spawn, spawn the speculative thread, that is going to prefetch for this load that I hope I'm going to execute some number of cycles later. And when the program encounters the spawn, this speculative thread is launched on the other thread context, or maybe somewhere else. And the hope is that while the program is executing, 
the speckle thread is also executing. And when the program gets to the slowdown and gets the cache miss, it won't get the cache miss anymore because the speckle thread finished execution and prefetched the data for the load into the cache. That's the idea. Uh, basically, pre-executed program piece can be considered a thread, right? And the speculative thread, this, this is not, again, specific to multi-threaded hardware. Right? The speculative thread can be executed on a separate processor, separate core, on a separate hardware thread context, or on the same thread context in idle cycles. Right? When you get a cache miss again, you can switch to the speculative thread that does prefetching. And when the cache miss returns back, you can switch to the main program. Right? Okay. So there are several questions we've uh, briefly gone over earlier. Uh, in earlier courses. How do you construct the speculative thread? The software can do it. The hardware can do it. There's additional hardware complexity. Uh, or you can use the original program, right? You don't construct anything at all. And that's what runhead execution does, right? Uh, you can execute it faster without stalling and correctness constraints. When you get to a cache miss, runhead execution does exactly that. You can, you can think of that as a speculative threading if you squint a little bit, except you don't construct the thread. And there are many, uh, we've covered some papers earlier uh, on this construction. The key is the speculative thread needs to discover misses, cache misses, before the main program, which means that it needs to somehow uh, avoid waiting or stalling, or it needs to compute less. Right? In case of run ahead, you kind of avoid waiting, right? When you get a cache miss, you invalidate the register and you keep going and trying to figure out other cache misses. In case of this thing that I described over here, somebody prunes the program and uh, gets the data flow and potentially the control flow leading to this load, and that gets executed, now you compute less. You're not doing everything that the main program does. You're doing only those things that would lead to uh, the address generation and execution of the load. And maybe you're predicting some of the values, right? Because you may not be able to stop. Uh, you may not be able to have the all data values ready when you actually spawn. All data values that you need as inputs to these instructions ready when you actually spawn this thread. Right? Because main program is still executing. In that case, you may want to predict some of those values to cut the dependencies between the main program and the speculative thread. So, okay, to get it, you can use value prediction and maybe minimize the computation you do. And this is the paper you read, simultaneous subordinate microthreading, but uh, this was the previous paper that actually has the same basic idea. It's called assisted execution. Basically, you have this speculative thread that assists the execution of the main program. And I've given you the idea here. You could do this for loads. You could have a fork point in the program that forks the speculative thread, which gets the cache miss. And when main program comes to the load, you get a cache hit. And hopefully, you get a speed up. Similarly, for branches, you can, have, you can fork a speculative thread that pre-computes the outcome of the branch. Mm. And when the branch is actually executed by the main program, you could use that as a prediction. That's the idea. And if you're interested in this, this, this is a very, uh, very uh, good branch prediction mechanism for hard to predict branches. Because it turns out hard to predict branches, it's very hard to find a branch predictor or design a branch predictor to predict them. Uh, but you can pre-compute them. And uh, if you're interested in that, the same person, Rob Chappelle, uh, has a paper that's called Difficult Path Branch Prediction. Using subordinate microthreading. It's a very detailed analysis of what kind of branches or how branches can be predicted. Uh, I believe it's micro 2002, but Maybe I'm wrong. It could be ISCA 2002 also. Han will <laughs> figure it out and <laughs> you'll see it on the uh, web page. Uh, 
but it, 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 it gives you a detailed design of a microprocessor that can actually do this pre-execution for very hard to predict branches. Okay, I think I will not cover all of these issues, but there are many issues which we briefly talked about. I don't know if we uh, talked about this in depth in 447, did we? Not in depth? Or you guys don't remember? <laughs> if you're, <laughs> yeah. So you can, ex uh, uh, you can execute the, and these issues lead to trade-offs, of course. Where do you execute the pre-computation thread? It could be on a separate core, separate thread context on the same core, and same core, same context, right? When the main thread is stalled. When do you spawn the pre-computation thread is another issue. Uh, and you can think about trade-offs here. Trade-off is basically what is the benefit and what is the cost. Uh, you could insert spawn instructions well before the load, problem load. But if you do that now, you may never get to that load, right? Because there are branches in between. Uh, or you could insert closer to the load, but then you may not cover the latency of the cache miss by the time you execute the load. Or you could spawn the pre-computation thread when the main thread is stalled. And there's also when do you terminate the pre-computation thread. Right? You may never terminate it. Maybe after you prefetch for this load, you keep executing some other part of the program. And we will see approaches like that very soon. Uh, you guys are willing to stay until 7 PM, right? <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> but we'll see approaches like that in the next lecture, I think. And we've seen uh, pre-installed cancel instructions. I think I covered this in both 447 and 740. And maybe, maybe you have feedback saying this thread is occupying a lot of resources, so kill it. Right? You can have contention feedback. OK, I think this is a good place to stop. But one example of this thread-based pre-execution is actually slipstream processors. But we'll start covering this uh, in the next lecture. I guess we can part now. I don't need to keep you here until 7 PM. So if you don't go right away, <laughs> we'll, we'll keep going. <laughs>